Hi, everybody. Scott Bird here with Integro. Thank you for joining us for another uh, entry in our webinar series. We've got a great one coming up here on data mapping and part of uh, your data privacy strategy there. And uh, got some big news. So you're used to our Integro webinars and we've had such great success of these. But Integro was just recently acquired by Innovative Discovery. So now we're part of the Innovative Discovery family. So big, exciting news, and uh, it's just been taken over the internet. Not sure if you noticed that on LinkedIn and Twitter and stuff, but it's been pretty huge. But anyway, that's big news. We're excited about it. Uh, it's going to be great for our staff of both uh, Innovative Discovery and Integro staff, and especially for our customers, because uh, information governance and e-discovery and privacy, these things all just go hand in hand, yin and yang, and so it's great to be on the same team here and really help our clients uh, across that full spectrum. So if you want to hear more about it, I think Justin will be sending out a link to uh, more on the announcement on that here if you haven't seen that already. So thank you for attending. We have a phenomenal attendance, great response on this webinar. Uh, so many people from all over, not just the United States and Canada, but worldwide as well. So welcome. We're glad you're here. We've got some great speakers today. We've got Linda Canelio, who's been at Integro for many years, and you may have seen her speak previously. And uh, thank you, Linda, for joining. Linda helps so many of our clients with information governance and privacy needs. We have Nate Latessa, who's my new, new teammate from Innovative Discovery. And Nate has been in the e-discovery world for many years and for the past decade in information governance. And so we are working very closely together. And, uh, it's a great, it's a great partnership. So Nate, thank you and glad you're here. Then we also have Joe Rosa. Joe is with uh, OneTrust and Joe helps clients, uh, Fortune 500 clients, deploy OneTrust at their enterprises. And we're flattered and delighted to have Joe here. And so with that, I'm gonna kick it off. Thank you very much. And uh, Linda, I think you take it from here. All right, thanks Scott. And uh, I want to welcome Nate, my new colleague, and Joe, I, I really appreciate your taking the time to be a panelist along with me. So, oh, there's our pictures. We were just discussing that we may not look exactly like that these days, that hair salons and barber shops uh, may <laughs> not be exactly the places we frequent these days. So anyway, uh, just kind of put that aside and we'll move on. So the next slide is going to ask or tell you something as if you didn't know this already. The, the world has changed and that feels like just such an understatement. I, I wonder how many of you are sitting at home watching this and how many of you are sharing your home office with maybe a spouse or children who are trying to learn remotely. For me, I feel like I've cooked more in seven, in seven months than I have my whole life, but that's pretty much an exaggeration. But really and truly, the world has changed a lot. And just when you're thinking that it couldn't change anymore, I'm gonna add one more change to it, to the list for you. And that change is gonna be that our work lives and our personal lives are becoming more digital and I think they're going to continue to become more digital. So what does more digital mean? Well, it means that more of our information is going to be in the cloud. It's going to be with us in SaaS applications and with third-party cloud providers. For example, Integro and our new friends at Innovative Discovery, we've recently um, changed or migrated to Office 365 and Teams. And I know a lot of your companies have done the same because I probably worked on some of those cleanup projects that you were doing before you were migrating to Office 365. I call it the digital spread. And this digital data spread is happening all over your organization. And it's happening one big reason it's happening is because we're all trying to work remotely and we tried to work remotely very quickly and we're trying to get our jobs done. So what do we have available to us to do our jobs efficiently and successfully? We have 
digital applications. Well, hey, Nate, my new colleague. <laughs> In some of the e-discovery, uh, with some of the e-discovery clients you've been working with, what are you finding uh, as some of the data sources that that they're asking about? Well, you know, when I think about like our forensics group, you know, it wasn't that long ago that you know laptops and desktops and you know workstations and servers were kind of the the big thing. We were doing a lot of collections on that, but now, you know, now that we've switched to this remote work, we're seeing things like Microsoft Teams and Slack. Um, Box and Dropbox, so all these things that can help us collaborate a lot better. We we're relying on those a lot more, and even internally, you know, as, a, as an organization, ID, um, you know, we rely on teams so much to stay connected to our teams and to, to share information. So we're seeing that out, out, you know, in the in the corporate world too. Great, and that uh, guess what? Data maps help you track your digital data spread. There's uh, lots of digital information out there that's personal. This uh, personal information really has become a commodity. It helps companies make money. When companies collect our personal data, they, they make money from it, or they may sell it to third-party vendors to make money. And as the amount of this, uh, it, if this data is collected, this personal information is collected, there are concerns growing about how that data is used and how long that data is retained. These concerns have really spurred a lot of the privacy regulations that we're seeing. And it's up to the governments to decide how they want to protect their citizens. And so here again, data mapping is going to give us the confidence that we can comply with some of these security regulations. I, I personally, and maybe the rest of you, don't think the collection of personal data is all bad. In, in fact, we give our personal information out a lot, especially these days. Think about DoorDash. Think about going to the grocery store and just picking up your groceries. You don't even go in. But whenever I give my personal information, maybe the same for you, I do so with the expectation that the company is going to secure it properly and is going to minimize the risk of some authorized, unauthorized access to my data. And really, for the most part, companies use my information in, a, in an ethical manner. But we keep hearing about these data breaches. And so you know what? Data maps help identify risk and put mitigation plans into action. So I think we've proven that the world is changing. And I don't know, Nate, what do you think? How many companies out there are ready for such a change? Well, I think I think the next slide tells a lot, right? 79% of respondents feel vulnerable. And I think a lot of this is, like you said, Linda, I mean, we have a lot of different data sources right now. You know, we don't know what's out there. The fact that we're having to rely on new technology, like I said, things like Slack and Teams. I mean, we've been using these things for a while, but now we're so reliant on them. And, you know, I think there's some concern that maybe, you know, we don't know, you know, the ins and outs of all these applications. You know, we don't know how to secure all this information because we're having to use so much new technology. So I think that's why you're seeing this number, you know, so high. It's, it's scary. Well, and I think we have a, uh, an example here of what can happen when a data privacy uh, crisis occurs. Go ahead, Nate. Yeah, I think this one, you know, this one really stood out. You know, when we were planning this, Linda, you and I talked, right? And, and I think one of the things that we were talking about was, um, you know, companies that were found in violation of GDPR and CCPA. And, you know, we saw some of the big names. We were talking about Google and, and Marriott and Facebook. And it's all the names we expect to see, you know, in the headlines. But this one really stood out to me because before you and I talked, I'd never heard of Hannah Anderson, right? And I, I did a little bit of research and I found out that, you know, Hannah Anderson's a, a children's clothing company with about 400 employees and about 140 million a year in revenue. So this is not some big, you know, name brand organization. This is a small children's clothing company here that is now in the middle of, uh, you know, this, this class action lawsuit with potential damages over seven and a half million dollars. You know, if I do some quick math, you know, that's about 5% of their annual revenue. So this to me is scary. This is, you're starting to see some of these small organizations, again, not these big companies. These are, you know, these mid-sized companies now that are having to deal with, with privacy. 
Yeah. And this one, this one I, to me was interesting because it's really the first class action a lawsuit asserting a violation to the CCPA regulation. So that's why I thought it was important and shared it with you. What I think we're going to do right now uh, for a moment is we're going to take a pause and we're going to ask our audience, you all, uh, a question. And the question is going to be, what's your biggest privacy concern? And as this poll comes up, you can see there's things like data breaches you might be concerned about, sharing data with your third parties, responding to DSARS or data subject access requests. Maybe it's your company's reputation that, that you're most concerned about, or what about large fines? And I'm gonna ask Joe here a, a question while you're all voting. Hey Joe, when you work with your clients at OneTrust, what's one of the most common concerns or uh, worries that you have to address? Yeah, great question, Linda. I think for me, the biggest thing is that overall reputation that a company has with its customers. You mentioned earlier, right, um, your experience as a consumer, you willingly give your data to companies where you know they're going to you know, use that data to make uh, a more convenient experience for you. But you know, what happens if that company experiences a breach? Right? Are you going to be as willing to give your data to that company? Probably not. Um, and as you think about the value of data to these different companies, um, the more that you can be a trusted organization, the more data you'll ultimately be able to collect. You'll be able to collect it in a, a fashion that is compliant with global privacy regulations. And the more you're gonna be able to use privacy as a competitive differentiator, right? We're seeing Apple start to really talk about how they differentiate on privacy and they're using that as a way of you know, bringing customers in. Um, and so to me, it's all about that reputation. And I think you know, in terms of these answers here, a data breach is probably going to be the one that, that affects that reputation the most. Well, there you go. Um, that was a really good way, Joe, of combining two answers into one, data breaches <laughs> and company reputation. Nice work. So it's our changing <laughs> world along with concern, these concerns that really combine to keep our data privacy confidence low. And what we're really going to do here to, in the rest of the uh, presentation is talk about what steps we can take right now to increase that confidence level in our data privacy. And uh, this slide here, guess what? Uh, risk management. Oh, well, thanks, Justin. We've got some uh, responses from the audience here. And it looks like there's quite a few people out there, Joe, who agree with you, data breaches, company reputation, but also high on the list of the sharing data with third parties. Uh, we'll talk here in a bit about how third parties, sharing our data with third parties can be tracked in a data map. So that's perfect. Thanks, Justin. Now, we're going to get to what's the top 10 the top 10 item on the uh, CEO list. Just this year, risk management made the top 10. And I say if it's on the top 10 list of the CEO, it's going to be on the top 10 list of the data privacy uh, consultant or the data privacy person at your organization. So let's move on and let's talk about data mapping. So really, what is this big deal around data mapping? You've heard me talk about it now five or six times. You most likely joined this webinar so you could learn more about it. So here you go. A data map is foundational to a stellar information governance program. It's a proactive approach to your privacy compliance and it's a key component in finding your data fast and operationalizing your privacy practices. So if you're starting to consider creating a data map, start at the bottom of what you see on the slide. Take a look at those privacy regulations that are out there. You know them as well as we do. There's the CCPA we've already talked about. There's the GDPR, there's the LGPD. You hear about those frequently, but there's a ton of other ones out there on the horizon. 
some of them and some of them have already been enacted. There's a lot of differences among these privacy regulations, but there's a lot of similarities. And as a privacy professional, it's really the similarities that drive us to what our privacy focus needs to be. And in my opinion, that focus is data protection and minimalization. And oh yeah, consumer rights is high on that list also. But a lot of times people are thinking about deleting some risky data, deleting some old data, and that's a good thing to think about. Sensitive data such as PII pose probably the most obvious risks, but old data or rot can be risky too. And I'm thinking if you're focusing on what's rot and what's risky, you're probably also thinking about what data do I retain? You're probably trying to find the sweet spot between data risk and reward, or at least you should be, because data again is a commodity. We need to use it properly. We need to use it to advance our business goals. When the value of data diminishes and it's not on legal hold, it's not required for any governance or law, then it should be deleted. A modern approach to information governance is really to associate retention with data as close to when it's created as possible, because there's not anybody who's gonna go back and add retention to old data later. Lastly, I wanna uh, emphasize data security risk and, and how it needs to be minim mitigated. It, to you, is it clear who's accessing your data for processing? And when we say processing data, it's usually done by your business units. For example, you may have people in your marketing department using Salesforce data to send invites to webinars, for example. In your HR department, you probably have people using Workday, and Workday data is being processed every time payroll is, is uh, in, enacted. Think about who can have access to your data. Is access to your data limited to a need-to-know basis? Is this information sold to third parties? How is the third party securing it? What about your cloud providers? It's with a data map that you can answer these questions in a confident manner. And if you're still not convinced, Joe, again from OneTrust, is gonna share more reasons why you should have a data map and why it's necessary. So Joe, take it away. Yeah, so I think the, you know, requirement that stands out to a lot of people as they think about global privacy regulations would be Article 30 of the GDPR, which specifically calls for the need to have a record of processing activity. There's similar requirements under the Brazilian LGPD law, which requires you to have a record of processing operations. So the text of the laws themselves, right, are a good source of why you might need that overall data map. But I think beyond just those specific, you know, call outs under these regulations, a data map is more important than just that. It's your essential map to understand what data are you collecting, why are you collecting that data, where might you be sending that to internally or to different third parties. And that's having a, an up to date and evergreen data map is going to be the only way you can tackle your different privacy challenges. Right, so if you need to update your notices from a CCPA perspective, you have to understand what data do we actually have and what data might we be collecting. If you have a consumer rights request, you need to be able to understand what applications or databases do I need to go to to find this information. Or if you have an incident or a breach and that's involving a specific asset or an application, um, you need to quickly understand, well, What's the um, nature of this breach? How many people might have been affected? Where might they you know, be coming from to know, you know what your overall obligations are? 
Nate, anything you'd add to you know why organizations might need a data map here? No, I think I mean I think we we all know that they're important, right? I think you know I've, I've been hearing for years how important it is to have this data map. Like Linda said, it's foundational. You know, this is what really is the starting point for everything, right? But I keep hearing, you know, from from corporations, even you know, as recently as the beginning of this year, it was one of the last conferences I went to. Uh, we talked to a bunch of you know chief legal officers, um, compliance officers, and the one thing I heard from all of them is we don't have a data map. We still don't. We know we need it, but we don't have one. You know, I'd like to know from you, Joe. What what are some of the problems you're seeing? What are what are some of the challenges? Why doesn't every company have one? What are what are the issues there? What's stopping you yeah. from, from getting a data map? Yeah, so I think it's you know a pretty overwhelming and daunting task when you think about sourcing all that data that you're collecting in your organization and you know understanding the use of that data. Um, one of the most common things I hear when I'm working with customers is that you know this customer has done a data map about a year ago. They haven't touched it since then, and now they feel like all that information is out of date. And I think this points to an overall pain point that a lot of organizations have, um, right? And that's making privacy a core value, not just in the privacy in the IT departments, but in the organization as a whole. Um, now, that's a problem, right? But how do we actually handle that and, and start to embed privacy in the organization? One of the ways I've seen this be successful is by identifying those established um, existing operations um, and finding an entry point for privacy into those operations. So for example, a lot of the technology companies I work with, they'll use a software development lifecycle um, tool where they track their new upcoming products or their features that they're gonna be building. Um, and an effective strategy here would be to integrate um, privacy assessments within that overall software development lifecycle, right? So if an engineer or product manager says, we're gonna build a new feature, ask them questions about how is this gonna impact the privacy of the customers whose data is gonna be tracked in here. Um, so that's kind of a, a key point there, I think, is just embedding privacy operations in established business processes. Yeah, and I agree. And, and you know, one comment about that too, one of the other things I've heard, and we're starting to see this, and Linda, you and I have worked on a couple um, opportunities right now where you know, one of the problems we're seeing is that you've got these organizations that there's so many data sources, right? It's not just a, a file share or, you know, an email server here and there in an archive. It's, you know, all of the above with those file shares, with, you know, the uh, uh, online storage account like Box or Dropbox, with the communications platform. And you have small companies that are, you know, 500 employees or 1,000 employees that have over 50 different data sources, right? So, you know, going back to what Joe said, it's, it's keeping that that data map fresh, so you're you know you're always evaluating or reevaluating what's on there, and then you know possibly even just kind of starting smaller here. It's it's not trying to to take everything at once. We got to find a place to start and just you know get at it. Is that? Hey Nate, uh, <laughs> Joe mentioned this uh, that a data map is an organizational wide asset, but. Can you relate that to what you're hearing from the legal folks and why is a data map even important for a, a legal department? Sure, I, I think, you know, in, in e-discovery, we're always having to go look for this information to find that. And, and what we tend to do is, is we react to a single case or a single matter. Something comes up and as a vendor, we go in and we have to go find where all this information is in the organization. And if they don't have this data map, we're kind of starting from scratch every time. So it's a long process to figure out who has what. You have to interview you know, custodians to figure out how they're using data, where it is, where it might be. I mean, this is a very long process. And a lot of times, a lot of that knowledge and a lot of the information you gain in the process is lost after that case. It gets thrown out and you don't have it anymore. So I think having that data map to start with and sharing that, it gives you such a head start on e-discovery. If you don't have to go find all the stuff and, you know, figure out what you know what all the different systems are and all the different platforms, you have such a major advantage. It's a huge advantage to have all that at your fingertips and be, able, be ready to go when there's when there's litigation. So here, here it is, as we've been uh, combining our companies and talking about how we complement each other, guess what? Data maps help not only in information governance, 
but they help for e-discovery e readiness also. Why don't you keep going, Joe, because I think you're going to give us more specifics about what do you even put into a data map? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. The way I approach this with my customers is to think about what your desired uses of that data map are ultimately going to be. Right, if you're building a, a data map to meet GDPR requirements, your uh, data map might look a little bit different than somebody who's, who's trying to build a data map to meet CCPA requirements. The GDPR is, puts a lot of emphasis on understanding your processing activities um, and understanding things like who's the controller versus who's the processor in the context of these given uh, business processes. In the CCPA, uh, as well as the GDPR, you need to understand what data are you collecting. So understanding those data elements using, you know, e-discovery, data discovery type tools to find those, but then overlaying that in, into these other components here, right? So your different IT assets, applications, understanding the different vendors who are the sources of the inf information, as well as who you're sending that data to. And by understanding where your information is, as well as who you might be sending it to, it's going to make fulfilling those access requests, as well as the deletion and opt out of sale requests, um, a much simpler process. Hey, Joe, thanks um, so much for all that good information. And we're getting a little close to the end of the 30 minute webinar, but I want to take a moment and actually repeat something that I think is really important. And Nate brought this up a moment ago and he said, why don't all companies have a data map? And you may be thinking, why doesn't my company have one? And I don't know all those answers for all of your companies, but I know a primary one that I run into a lot. One of the most common reasons a company doesn't have a data map is because it gets assigned to one department. And usually that's the IT department. And you know what, they have their day jobs too. If one department is assigned the, da the data map responsibilities, do they know all the processing activities that's going on across all the departments in the organization? No, they don't know that. So it's impossible for one department to create and maintain a green data map. We have to begin looking at creating a data map uh, not simply as a project that we assign to one department, but a data map becomes an enterprise asset. And if it's an enterprise asset, then it's the responsibility of all departments. And we want to approach it with the same efforts, care, concern that we expound on any of our other uh, company products, services, or even our brand. So Justin, if you could just flip the slides to the end. I wanna just share with you that if you don't have a data map today and you're saying, you know, it's just not happening in my organization, what is it that you can do? Well, call us, call Integro ID and let us help you because we're really good at doing the heavy lifting. We're gonna gather those key stakeholders that need to be gathered. We're gonna gather those department heads. We're gonna go out and catalog all of your data locations and your processing activities. We're gonna put them into the platform, the technology platform that best meets your needs and that does the best job in the whole data mapping and privacy platform. In short, we're gonna build you a data map that meets your objectives and it's going to help boost your privacy confidence. So you know what? We might already be working with your company. We might be working on some information governance projects with you, maybe some records management projects, maybe some e-discovery projects in, in Nate's world, or how about a data cleanup project that we've been doing for a lot of our customers. That's the best time to initiate a data mapping exercise. So when you have a chance, call the right partner, call Integro and ID, and uh, we'd be happy to, to uh, help you get this off the ground and rolling 
and become an actual vital part of your privacy program as it should be the fundamental part of it. And we're gonna offer all of the attendees here today a free privacy assessment. All you have to do is contact me, Linda Canelio, at Innovative Discovery, my new employer, and uh, Nate and I will come out and help you assess where you are, what your needs are, and get you the right data map to meet your requirements. So I wanna thank everybody for attending and I hope to see you soon. Bye.